From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. And breathe, everybody. The melt-up is back on. Tesla is bid. Have the Italians reached out for a cyber truck? We will debate this rolling rally. Month five, if we can close out. Countdown to the Open kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Up. Edging higher, futures trade up, they digest the latest data and Fed speak. President Biden gaining ground and Donald Trump in the key blue wall states. And disruption on the East Coast after a Baltimore bridge collapses. We begin with the big issue. Have we reached irrational exuberance? We are seeing signs of, you know, the, the wall of worry having been completely dissolved. Uh, very uh, aberrant behavior in the options markets, betting on stocks doubling in the course of three or four days, uh, incredible. Betting on uh, the Nasdaq rallying a further 33 percent out to June after already rallying 30 percent since the October low. All of these things say that there is a feeling that the market is an invincible. Invincibility, a beautiful thought. No. Invesco's Brian Levitt writes this this morning. I had spent much of my career imploring investors to manage their emotions. I, as much as anyone, knew that breaking from investment plans at inopportune times had typically cost investors dearly. Brian Levitt joins us now alongside Nuveen's Anders mm -hmm. Pearson. Now, uh, Brian, of course, what you've got to put this context in, this was when a market was tumbling out of bed. You were exceptionally cautious and worried and you were so close to pressing the sell button. Here we are in a euphoric market. It's rising. It's rising. There's weaponized FOMO. What does your emotion tell you right now about market participation for you? Well, my emotion tells me that, and, and my, my views tell me that peak inflation, peak tightening, peak interest rates tend to be good for stocks over the subsequent years. So if you're looking at near-term indicators of sentiment, it may suggest that things are a little bit too bullish or a little bit too optimistic in the short term. And look, markets always tend to have some pullbacks in a given year, but I still come back to that principle that Inflation's be beyond us. We've, it's peaked months ago. The Federal Reserve is going to be easing and normalizing the yield curve. And over the subsequent years, that tends to be a good backdrop for equities and credit. OK, it, it has peaked, but it is sticky. Um, Anders, good morning. Some people say there's an irrationality in credit. What do you say? Well, I would, I would uh, pretty much echo what Brian said. I think it's a similar trends on the credit side that we're seeing on the equity side, that uh, momentum is holding up very well and, and you know, for, for mostly good reasons. Uh, fundamentals are holding up quite well. I think we're finding a lot of investors are looking at the credit markets and look at yields that are, are very attractive. If you look at investment grade at over 5%, high yield, close to 8 mm -hmm. senior loans around 9 or higher in many respects, those are attractive income levels. And while we can argue that spreads on the credit side have have become a little bit more on that fully valued range. Uh, at the same time, your momentum continues to be uh, behind us. So from that perspective, uh, we could see that continue for a bit longer. OK, well, we'll dig into, we'll dig into the premium of 8% is enough over cash at 5 and a quarter percent uh, and maybe even the risk of no cuts. But that, there's a combination that we can discuss. Let's talk about the Fed speak uh, this week because the latest uh, from the Fed governor, Lisa Cook. The risks? to achieving our inflation and employment goals are moving into better balance. The risk of easing monetary policy too soon or too much is that it could allow above target inflation to become entrenched and halt the progress that we have seen. A note of caution from Ms. Cook. Bloomberg's Mike McKee is with me. Uh, I mean, Bostick and Cook yesterday took a little bit of heat out of the equity market in the first instance, Mike. But give us your take. 
Well, we got a little bit back today, Madison. It's because we're all data dependent at this point, including the Fed. Durable goods orders came in stronger than expected, up 1.4 percent. Capital goods, non-defense, X Air, that's the proxy for business spending, goes uh, into GDP, also much stronger than anticipated. But then shipments were down. So what is it telling us about business spending and the economy? It's a little bit of a, a mixed message. Uh, the one reason that we saw such a big gain in durable goods, by the way, was uh, Boeing. Uh, they rebounded a little bit in February, selling 15 aircraft. And look, at that's Boeing. That's the Boeing effect there. And you can see how volatile it is when uh, the Boeing orders come in and out. So that's why Wall Street doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to the headline. But in general, a little bit of strength, which means the Fed has to decide what it's going to do. And as you pointed out, there is a difference now, a split on the Fed. We'll see if it closes as they get closer closer to their main meeting. But yesterday, we saw Rafael Bostic of Atlanta reiterate the one cut this year theme he sounded on Friday, followed by Austin Goolsby from Chicago saying he thinks three cuts are probably the most likely thing. And then Lisa Cook coming down in the middle saying we just need to be cautious. She didn't take a side one way or the other. But it does look like at this point the Fed is confused as everybody else about the economy and where it's going. Fortunately, they don't have to trade day to day. No, well, there's a, there's a trifecta there, isn't there? You can you, you can take whatever portion of the dinner menu you, you want there. Mike, thank you very much, Mike McKee on Fed Speak. My guests this morning are Anders Pearson, Brian Levitt. Uh, Anders, to you first of all. I mean, there's not an, there is a non inconsiderable amount of dots at two cuts, and Bostic voicing one cut. But you you're dug in at three. Why? Yeah, I think our base case is that uh, we're going to have three cuts this year, and, and and certainly, you know, our take is that particularly Powell is is quite keen to get going at some point. Uh, our our view is that it's going to be this summer, you know, data dependent, of course, if it's a June or July kind of type time frame. But uh, our view is again, the Powell is is quite itching to kind of rip the bandaid off and get going, and and for now, three cuts seems like the most natural kind of type uh, approach here too to keep the balance going. And I think investors get a little bit carried away around how quickly it will happen, what have you. Uh, we could see them taking a pause at some point as well. But uh, at the same time, we do expect uh, a, a summer time frame is the natural first uh, step from a, from a cutting perspective. Brian, if, if we talk about the triggers for pause, um, we've yet to see anything re really cause a pause. You know, 500 basis points in hikes. It's a strong growth economy. Employment is is sub 4%. All, all of the bricks in, are, are there of a very strong, robust U.S. exceptionalism. It's trading at 23 times earnings or, or, or thereabouts at the moment. How much more road have we got to travel? Well, I want to make two points. The first is around this idea of cuts. There's, uh, it's almost as if we worry if there's only one cut that that's going to be a major challenge for the market. The reality is that just means we have a, a relatively strong economic backdrop, which should yeah. be good for earnings. So the denominator in the valuations that you speak about. Now, with regards to the multiples on the S&P 500, they are a bit elevated compared to history. A lot of that tends to be concentrated in the in the top 10 names, many of which who have not seen their valuations actually go up all that much, even though their prices have gone up because their earnings have delivered. If you look at the average S&P 500 company or the other 490 names, they're generally trading in line with um, – with long-term averages. And if you consider the the earnings yield on the broad market and compare it to a 10-year Treasury rate, it's pretty much at par. So it's pretty much equal. So it suggests that stocks are neither expensive nor cheap to bond. So I wouldn't be overly concerned about valuations. They've never been a good timing tool anyway. And again, back to that point, the, the average S&P 500 stock is not particularly overvalued. And there's one piece that came to my attention this morning is Larry Fink. And this, I, I hear what you say, which is I can get, I can get 8%, I can get uh, five, five, plus 5% 5 uh, on investment grade, 8% over on, on high yield. But Larry Fink really grasped the zeitgeist this morning in, in a note. He said, this is about debt. It is more urgent than I can ever remember. More leaders should pay attention to America's snowballing debt scenario. 
a bad scenario akin to Japan in the 1990s is something that could evolve. It's a very, very serious series of warnings about what could happen. Now, he says we're not in a debt crisis. Is a debt crisis inevitable? No. But at some juncture, sovereign markets of the United States of America will face an incredible headwind. Does that, does that come into your thinking at all? Yeah, and I think we're going to add, we add some comments from the CBO side as well, kind of looking into to where things could be going going forward. So, yeah, no, I mean, certainly we debate that uh, quite a bit on our team, and we get questions from clients all the time around this. You know, for now, I would say that we're looking at sort of the where we're sitting here today, and partly from a treasury issuance, that should be quite balanced uh, in the coming months. There was a lot of discussions around that and without potentially would do the rates as we were sitting here come back in November. You know, they're basically been using bills primarily and until April, we're going to get the tax receipts coming in and then probably get steady auctions for the rest of the year. So as I'm looking here, you know, for 2024, it's probably going to be a, a fairly stable environment and it's really more probably a 2025 and beyond kind of type issue. So certainly not ignoring it, but I think for now, you know, the markets are going to be more focused on kind of having stable auctions, successful auctions. We just saw the 20 year auction being very successful and, and really focusing probably more on the elections and what kind of happens on that front. Because let's not forget that that will have an impact on where we take the debt levels going forward as well. That number could be uh, meaningfully larger if you have a sweep on one side or another. So for now, I think the market's going to be probably focused a little bit more, you know, kind of Fed cuts, how the economy, inflation, what have you. But certainly, as we're thinking 2025 and beyond, that is an area that we're going to have to start, uh, you know, basically counting in a little bit more. Brian, can we just round off with you? I've had a number of people talk to me about cyclicality and what that means. I stopped Jen yesterday upgrading their financials for the first time since 2021. Briefly, what is cyclicality? You favor it. How do you make it come alive? Yeah, the cyclicality would come into play typically around a Fed easing cycle and the normalization of the yield curve and a, a catalyst for, for broader economic activity into hopefully even an expansion. And so in that type of environment, you want to favor energy, financials, industrials, and you're starting to see that work a bit. You have seen some broadening out of this market, uh, which, is a, which is a good sign and is likely in anticipation of this easing cycle that we will get. Um, over the next year, year and a half. Okay, Anders, thank you so much. Uh, Brian, thank you for being with me. Brian Levin there, uh, and Anders. A quick snapshot of what's going on in markets this morning. You have 10-year government bond yields uh, ticking up ever so slightly. A little bit more coming to auction today, fives and sevens. Uh, and, of course, PIMCO, they uh, have a smaller exposure to U.S. Treasuries than they do perhaps to the U.K. and Canada. Euro dollar, uh, that's the euro up by two-tenths of one percent. And gold trades up nine-tenths of one percent, trading through record highs ahead of the PC on Friday. Let's look under the hood of the stocks ahead of the opening bell. Abigail Doolittle is with me. Well, Manas, overall, we do have the index futures up just slightly, but one stock that's weighing heading to a second down day in a row, that is Apple. And this, of course, on the report that China iPhone shipments fell 33 percent in February. This is very consistent with a report that we had earlier uh, this year, uh, earlier this month, I should say, that the iPhone maker uh, saw a 24 percent plunge in iPhones in the first six weeks of the year. This stock now down 15 percent from its December peak, so truly in a correction. Tesla, on the other hand, up 3.3 percent. It seems to be that it has to do with Italy contacting Tesla, the country's industry ministry, uh, reaching out to the company about potential production of electric trucks, that Cybertruck. And then finally, the big winner, Viking Therapeutics, up about 16 percent. They put up good early uh, study results for their weight loss uh, pills. The street's very pleased. Truist is saying that the data is strong. The study was strong. The stock should be strong on this. Indeed, it is. Plus, there is a 12 percent short interest. So some of those bears running for cover. Abby, thank you so much. Abigail Doolittle there uh, with the latest moves on the market. Coming up, I take you to a live shot of the Francis Scott Bridge in Baltimore, which has collapsed after being struck by that container ship. We're waiting the news conference that will begin at 9.30 a.m. Now, this is the Francis Scott Bridge, as I say. The FAA are restricting drone flights near this major commuter bridge. You're looking at the price of AP Muller Marsk, which is uh, the ship that uh, you're looking at there, is uh, indeed uh, chartered by Marisk. We'll have more details on this tragedy through the morning. The news conference at 9.30 and AT Live with all the details is available on your Bloomberg terminal.
We are still very much in an active search and rescue posture at this point, and we will continue to be for some time. There were likely multiple people on the bridge at the time of the collapse, and that, as a result, multiple people were in the water. We may be looking for upwards of seven individuals. That's the latest information we have. Getting details through, and there will be more as the morning goes on. You're looking at live pictures of the collapse bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. It collapsed around 1.30 a.m. this morning after it was rammed by a container ship plunging vehicles and pedestrians into the water. The collapse also causing chaos at the port of Baltimore. It's one of the most important ports on the U.S. eastern seaboard. Amy Morris joins us now with more. So the ship, Amy, uh, it, it's unclear. There's been a number of reports, ABC reporting about a loss of control uh, of the ship and that there was some kind of warning. Before we get to this press conference, what more can you tell me? Well, there was some loss of control on the ship. If you go back and look at the video of when the ship actually hit the bridge, you can see smoke billowing. You can see the lights flickering. You can see that the ship makes a very sudden turn into the bridge abutment, which is why a lot of people at first thought, wow, could this have possibly been intentional? Law enforcement officials have made it very clear it was not intentional, or at least there's no evidence to suggest that it may have been intentional. FBI is on the scene. So is the Coast Guard. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has also said that they're investigating. The White House is being kept apprised of all of this. The federal officials, state and local officials, they're all working together to figure out just how this could have happened and why one ship hitting one part of the bridge caused the entire bridge to fall into the water. Now, this has got, you know, we, 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 there's a human tragedy side to this. We're waiting to hear uh, what the impact has been in this news conference, but also there are ramifications for one of the busiest ports on the eastern seaboard. If you just look at the volume of autos going through this port, 847,000 light trucks and cars went through it in 2023. What may it mean to supply chain, to diversions? Do we know any details in terms of uh, the, the ramifications? This could have tremendous ramifications. The Port of Baltimore was number one in shipping farm equipment, construction equipment, cars, um, coal. It was number one in shipping so many different things just from that one port in the past year. So to have that completely cut off is definitely going to have an impact on the supply chains. It's just not clear exactly what yet. I did hear from local officials on the scene who say they are still trying to get engineers to the scene. They've talked to several different engineering firms so they can see how long it's going to take to try to find a workaround for this. Okay, Amy, thank you so much. That is Amy Morris. Let's turn our attention to politics. We have the latest Bloomberg News morning consult poll. It shows President Biden gaining against the Republican challenger, Donald Trump, in six key swing states. The blue wall, Amory knows it well. Amory Hordern can talk me through what is the progress for Biden in this poll. Good morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, Madison. Well, we've been conducting this poll over the course of a few months, and by far, this is Biden's best showing when it comes to this monthly poll, and that is because he's able to gain ground in six of these seven key swing states, though we should note that Trump is gaining ground in, in, in Georgia, one that Biden has not been able to, to do just yet. And he's also been able to flip one. So when it comes to Wisconsin, Biden is now leading Trump by one point. He trailed him by four points in February. Pennsylvania, they are tied, but Trump had a six-point lead last month, and they're also tied to Michigan. And you mentioned the blue wall. The blue wall. This is really important to the Biden campaign. It's the northern battlegrounds, and they would pretty much all but mean Biden would have a second term if he's able to hold on to these uh, northern battleground, these blue wall states. And what we're showing is that he is graining ground and even flipping when it comes to um, when it comes to Wisconsin. So. By and large, this is a good showing for the current president, given what we've seen in the prior polling and data we've had. One thing I would note, Manus, of course, especially as we're waiting important PCE data later this week, Americans, the swing state voters, are starting to feel better about the economy. The issue is they still say Trump is better when handling a wide range of pocketbook issues, everything from finding good, good jobs and also as well things like interest rates. 
Yeah, but to a certain extent, that this was the narrative that the White House was hoping would eventually filter through. I just looking at the driving season coming up, the price of gas is going to be at four dollars. That is going to bite in the pocketbooks. What do you make of, of uh, the, the, the Trump story, the SPAC deal that went through yesterday? The stock is, it was trading up furiously. Of course, the conundrum now is how can Trump utilize perhaps the value within the SPAC for himself? Can he? Or what, what, are, what are the impacts? of this deal. This is his, his social media company reversing into a SPAC and uh, I, I think if it stays at this kind of price he's going to be worth six billion bucks. Well for the first part it means that he was able to get on the Bloomberg's billionaire index right and this is going to be a windfall for the former president. Uh, there is this six month lockup period but I did see some reporting that if he was to able to get the OK from members of his board which we should note um, people on this board of, of this media company of the likes of Cash Patel, Robert Lighthizer, individuals that worked under the Trump administration, then potentially he can actually sell shares sooner. So that would give him a major windfall, especially as he's paying a number of legal fees. Indeed. Uh, well, we'll keep an eye on that. So, Price. Amory, thank you very much for being with us on the very latest poll. Coming up, we'll give you the morning calls on Bloomberg. up is back. One stock at the bottom of your screen, Trump Media Technology, is rising furiously up 27 percent. What will it mean uh, for the wealth of the contender in the presidential race? Stocks are rising. Got a nice bump in Tesla. Some tech is up. Abigail will take you through uh, the, the Trump stock in just a moment. Time now for your morning calls. This is what we've got from Wall Street. Jeffries upgrades Clorox to hold. The analysts say that the company's exit from Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay is a long-term positive. Next up, Berenberg downgrades Stellantis to a hold. The analysts say there is little meaningful near-term upside and highlights a challenging 2024 for the auto industry. Finally, Raymond James raises the price target on Disney. Barclays upgrades the stock yesterday on the company's turnaround story. Coming up, well, we are set to return to Baltimore, uh, addressing the Francis Scott Key bridge collapse. We'll bring you that live as it happens right here on Bloomberg. Good morning from New York. Feel the relief of the nice end of the Nasdaq uh, because the mega meltdown is back. You got Tesla, Tesla a bit up nicely this morning. We just had Invesco with us saying this is a justifiable situation. This is not a mania. This is not an exuberance. You have the likes of Tesla also flying higher. Uh, there's the bell at the opening bay. We're up three tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq at the moment. Uh, and in terms of the rest of the asset classes, keep an eye. You got Euro dollar up an eighth of one percent, even though Pimco, for example, are not as long of U.S. Treasuries as they are relative. They have a preference for the U.K. and Canada. That's Andrew Bowles. A little bit more auction paper coming to the market. Fives and sevens will come. But PIMCO, talk about the pace of rate, rate cuts in the USA being slower than the rest of the world. And gold is up uh, by six-tenths of one percent. We've uh, gone through some records recently on that because uh, there is a little bit of uh, concern and hesitation ahead of the PCE on Friday. Core PC expected to come in at plus 0.3%. One stock to watch, I mentioned it to you, it's Tesla. Now, an Italian newspaper is reporting that the country's officials have contacted the EV maker about their electric truck. Craig Trudell is with me. I mean, this truck is, I mean, it's a thing of beauty if you look at it conceptually. But talk me through. The Italians uh, are, are keen on this. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's it's worth uh, kind of taking a breath on on this one, Manis. Uh, just in in the sense that uh, this this company has been 
uh, making uh, semis under pilot production for more than a year. And as of late last year, the company, uh, an executive, uh, said that they had roughly 100 in their fleet. So this is really moving at a pretty glacial pace for Tesla. Uh, we also had a very interesting uh, interview on, on Bloomberg Television last week with the CEO of Daimler Truck, uh, who believes that uh, Tesla would have to redesign uh, the, the semi for European use, that it's too long. So, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, Tesla ever actually uh, makes the, the semi in Italy, I think we're a long way from, from learning that. And, and my, my suspicion is that uh, this is a reaction to Elon Musk saying in Germany recently that, you know, eventually it may make sense for Tesla to make semis there. Okay, it's always uh, it's an interesting one between price cuts, BYD competition, car production cuts, and here you go, a good news story uh, coming through from Italy. We'll run with it, Craig. Thank you very much, Craig Trudell. To the social media uh, spectrum, Trump Media Technology Group soaring ahead in the first session as a publicly traded company. Abigail Doolittle has the details on DJ. Abby. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Just moments ago, it was up 58%, currently up closer to 30%. But either way that you take a look at it, absolutely soaring on its first day of trading, the Trump Media and Technology Group after its post-SPAC debut. They basically did a SPAC merger with Digital World Acquisition, as you mentioned, the new ticker DJT. Difficult to uh, uh, forget with the former president, his initials, of course. And it gives the parent company of Truth Social more than $275 million in capital, a win for Trump amid legal and financial uh, woes, we should say. And at current levels, Trump's shares are worth, it's hard to calculate at this moment, at 11, when it was up 11%, that his shares would be worth $6 billion. So many, many multiples of that. Uh, he is subject to a six-month lockup along with performance requirements. Now, while making the entity profitable is important, in this election year, Manus, this may be the ultimate way of doing an informal bid or look at the election. Lots of investors using this as a way to bet on his bid for re-election. CEO of Accelerate Financial Holdings saying that the underlying business fundamentals will matter at some point. But for now, quote-unquote, DJT is the mother of all media stocks with the stock up 32 percent up as much as 58 percent today hard to disagree let's see what the long-term trajectory is on the profitability i mean thank you very much abigail doolittle there with the very latest on the social media scene let's turn to consumer space crispy cream donuts are coming to mcdonald's uh, across the u.s it's the burger giant's latest effort to boost the business breakfast simone foxman is there oh a crispy cream at 3 a.m in the morning there's a thought simone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a sugar rush. You know, it's also a sugar rush for Krispy Kreme investors is what the shares are doing today. We've seen them pretty much recoup all of their losses so far this year. This is the biggest rally in Krispy Kreme shares since the company IPO'd back in July 2021. Uh, we understand that there was a test of selling Krispy Kremes at McDonald's at, at, uh, in two cities in Kentucky, Louisville and Lexington at 160 restaurants. According to a statement announcing this deal this morning, the Demand exceeded expectations, and so Krispy Kreme donuts will roll out in the second half of 2024 uh, and end up in all McDonald's locations by the end of 2026. Part of the reason investors like this, though, uh, according to the CEO of Krispy Kreme, this will double the points of access for people who want these Krispy Kreme donuts across the country. It had been having a, a bit of a tough year, too, because, uh, as City put it, the outlook it put forward uh, back in February was not so sweet uh, with pressures from inflation uh, and other things on its ingredients. Uh, also saw a, a little bit of a slowdown in, in terms of expectations for what people wanted, but now it will be much wider uh, availability of Krispy Kreme donuts, and that's clearly a positive for the stock this morning, Manus. Volume is everything, isn't it? There you go, <laughs> Krispy Kreme and your McDonald's. Uh, Simone, thank you very much. Let's pivot to Marisk stock this morning. Now, this is the Danish firm. It, it, it is uh, the chartering company uh, of the vessel that, uh, as you can see there, crashed into the Francis Scott Bridge in Baltimore. Naha Katan joins me now. So what do we know in terms of the staffing? Is it Marisk staff who were on this ship, who actually owns the ship? How does Marisk uh, using this ship play out? Thank you. Thank you for having me. So. Um Actually, its shares fell after it said it chartered the ship, but um, the ship sails under the flag of Singapore, and our Bloomberg intelligence experts say that the company 
may not be directly responsible for the collapse because the company had no crew on board and the ship was operated by a charter company. Uh, but we are seeing um, possibility of an extended shutdown and that's going to cause major congestion for travelers and businesses, possibly for months because the bridge um, you know, allows commercial ships to enter the port of Baltimore. It's one of the top ports in the U.S. Uh, by volume uh, and value. It handled over 10 million tons of cargo annually. And um, it's also the largest U.S. port for handling cars and light trucks. Um, it also uh, handles sugar, imported sugar, coffee, and coal for export. So we're expecting that resulting bottleneck could accelerate a shift of goods through to the West Coast ports. Would that almost be immediate, Naha? I mean, we're in the midst of managing a crisis, a uh, human aspect to this crisis, a logistical aspect to this crisis. How quickly can shipping divert? It literally is instantaneous, isn't it? Right. I mean, for now, uh, if you go around the the bridge, it, uh, you know, extends the time from half an hour to about an hour. So this would have to be, uh, you know, pretty quick, a pretty immediate shift. OK. Now, uh, we are waiting that uh, news conference to begin. As it does, we will bring that to our viewers. Naha Katan there on the implications for Marisk, uh, the chartering company of the ship that collided with the bridge in Baltimore. Now, China is seeking to shore up confidence in the economy. Some of the U.S. CEOs in Beijing are receiving uh, an invite uh, to a Wednesday meeting with the top Chinese leader, widely expected to be President Xi Jinping. Pfizer and FedEx are the chiefs are uh, potentially uh, having those meetings. Ender Curran is with me now. This is a very interesting moment. We have monetary policy, fiscal policy, and then we have brand G engagement, don't we? Indeed, Miles, it looks like classic outreach from the Chinese authorities. Several of the big CEOs of U.S. companies are in, are, are in Beijing at the moment for a conference. And throughout that gathering, the officials in China have been sending a message to the world that they are open for business, that the economic downturn is in hand, that they have policy tools to turn that around. And now we have our colleagues reporting that it looks like there's a, a meeting with a senior leader being set up for Wednesday. It's expected to be President Xi Jinping. That's a similar kind of model to what we saw at APEC in San Francisco back in November when the executives had an opportunity to uh, had an audience with Xi Jinping back then. So, you know, to your point, it's when you consider the backdrop being about FDI at its, at its worst in decades, overall kind of global sentiment towards China being pretty negative at the moment, this looks like a classic opportunity for President Xi Jinping to meet with leaders of some top US and global companies and, of course, make the sales pitch for what China can offer them. From an economic perspective, and uh, you talk about FDI, how critical is it? You've got fixed asset investment, you've got the consumer spending, you've got industrial spending, but you have FDI is the, perhaps the biggest issue. It's been that vacuum of money coming out of China. The flow has not been in the right direction. How critically important is it to Xi Jinping, and where do we stand on FDI right now? I think it is important, Manus. I mean, the backdrop is we know... China's economy has rebalanced over the years. It is now, of course, more consumer-driven than it has been. It is no longer just about manufacturing and exports, say. But FDI is still a very important generator of economic activity and profits and exports. And especially during the downturn that China's experiencing now, of course, they want foreign know-how. They want foreign technology. They want foreign capital. They want to see that sector expanding and growing. Uh, some of the sectors aren't necessarily critical for their own national ambitions, but at the same time, at this stage of the economic cycle, I don't think many countries would want to be actively turning away FDI. So it is important. And the other side, of course, of that ledger, as you mentioned, is the portfolio flows. Uh, global investors really have turned south on China over the past year or two at this stage, uh, and there's no sign of that turning around in a hurry. The price reaction for an economist, Intel and AMD, I'm sure you didn't spend a great deal of time mining down into that, but if I look at that as a reflection of the potential for escalation in tariffs and restrictions, um, there doesn't seem to be much of an off-ramp, even in this Biden administration on the tariffs. And the risk is that you go into a second administration from Trump and that things escalate. Um, 
you know, how important is it for the world that there is some kind of an off-ramp in tariffs, that we head backwards rather than forwards and higher? Well, we're set, we certainly seem to be in some kind of a holding pattern right now, Miles, ahead of the election. As you say, the current administration was pretty hawkish also on the trade front. They maintained those tariffs against China. They, they pushed through various export and investment controls and the like. And, of course, now we have to wait and see what kind of administration comes out the other side of the election in November. But then, to your point, regardless which side it is, it's going to be either pretty hawkish or very hawkish altogether on China. And if it is the latter, with um, former President Trump talking about you know, tariffs of maybe 60% or higher on, on Chinese goods, then obviously that would certainly impact trade between the world's two biggest economies. And it would have a cachet around the world. It wouldn't just be tariffs, don't forget. There are other tools as well around investment and export controls. So it's fairly delicately poised right now. Uh, you know, the world economy has a lot of fragility underneath the surface of OK GDP growth. So if the two biggest economies do go at it again in terms of an, a resumption of the trade war, then obviously that will reverberate right around the world. And, of course, this all comes as the bow form takes form. There's a lovely line in there about FDI slumping to a near 30-year low in 2023 in China. So they've got a heck of a lot of work to do. And thank you very much, as ever, for being with me, Enda Karen, there on the macro story with China. Uh, plenty more ahead uh, on Bloomberg. We're waiting for uh, the press conference to begin in Baltimore. Uh, you're looking at live shots uh, of that pretty tragic scene uh, of the uh, bridge in Baltimore. We'll bring you that news conference as soon as it begins. The S&P 500 is on track, on track to notch five straight months of gains from November through to March. Bloomberg's Jess Menton is here to talk me through the stats. This is a rare, rare winter rally, Jess. I mean, it'll be quite something. If we do get to the close of business on Thursday, we'll have only done this a couple of times since 2013. That's right. And it's very rare, specifically if you're looking from November to March, because that time period, usually, as you know, there tends to be tax loss harvesting. So tends, when you look back in history, usually you might see a down year in December or January. But the only other time this century that we've seen a five-month streak of gains from November to March was actually in 2013. And then before that was actually in 1998. So that just shows you how rare this is. So in order for that to happen, the S&P 500 on Thursday would need to close around 5247 and try to get close to 5250 there to hold on to those double digit gains. So we'll have to see over the next few sessions. And in terms of this melt up, I mean, you've got Oppenheimer going for 5500. You've got StockGen talking about 5500. Is there any sense when you look at the data, if you rally as furiously as this in a five month period, what happens in the ensuing periods? Well, typically what happens, and Jeff Hirsch over at the Stock Traders Almanac, he's really an encyclopedia of stock market knowledge. So he crunched the numbers to look at how rare it's been to see that five-month span from November to March. And typically what happens is the remaining of the nine months, uh, there's actually been only 11 instances since 1950, but typically over that nine-month span, the remainder of the year, so the second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, you do see in all 11 of those instances, the S&P 500 notching gains over that time period, not just for those nine months, but also on an annual basis. And through those nine-month period, it was about a 12% gain for the S&P 500. And then not just that, we also tend to see gains also in April, nine of the 11 instances there. So I know people are eager to see as the calendar flips to the second quarter whether or not those gains can hold. But history typically bodes well. Bodes well. What, <laughs> what, I mean, you know, I just had Invesco with me a little bit earlier, and they were saying, look, whether it's three cuts, two cuts, or one cut, it is not going to interrupt the narrative in the equity market. And I'm hearing this more and more. It is about the earnings, and those earnings had better live up to expectations. To what extent do the people that you talk to predicate their bullish view or this, the, the, this enthusiasm to rate cuts as well? Well, it really, to your point, builds on the case of where the projection is for corporate earnings. And once again, in the fourth quarter, we did see those expectations pretty smashed there and beating things, especially when you came in and the expectations were for the S&P 500 to have earnings growth close to flat, but it ended up coming in around 8 or 9% higher than that. But if you look on an annual basis for the S&P 500 earnings growth this year, it's supposed to be around 11%, but those numbers haven't really budged too much from almost last May. So the consensus there is if growth continues 
continues to remain strong, maybe that could be feasible. But then if you do see growth pull back, whether or not that would have to be rectified in some of those profit expectations. But again, a lot of that has been carried, not surprisingly, by that magnificent seven and those growth stocks over the past year. So the base effects, if you just look year over year period as we go through the remainder of the year, won't be quite as robust compared to that base effect they were going off of 2022. So it'll be interesting to see as that narrows out with those tech and growth companies, what that means more broadly for the index and what other corners of the index we can see really carry some of this profit growth expectations. Jess, thanks. Great story and certainly worth a read. Jess Menton uh, there from Bloomberg reporting. Uh, let's turn back to the tragedy at the bridge in Baltimore. Joining me now to talk about the impact on trade. It is Brent Bloomberg's Brendan Murray. Brendan, good day to you. Uh, we're waiting for this news conference to come uh, to tell us uh, more information uh, about the Francis Scott Bridge, the tragedy. But in terms of the perspective of this port on the eastern seaboard, why is it so critical to the flow of global trade into America and out? Well, it's, it's one of the top 20 ports uh, in overall volume in the United States, uh, but it's, it's also a key port for, for auto industry exports and imports. So that, that is going to be a major issue. Uh, the, the, by all accounts, uh, the, the port is going to be severely restricted for perhaps months. Uh, it might be closed completely for a, a long time. So the question is, how, where, is all that, where are all those goods going to flow? Uh, and th th those are questions right now we're asking to other ports along the the eastern seaboard. Uh, the, the Port of Baltimore uh, did about $80 billion, $80 billion worth of cargo value last year. That's about $6.5 billion a month. So every month uh, that, that the port is, is shut or, or, or restricted is going to cost the local economy a lot of money. The port is one issue. The other issue is the traffic congestion around this major U.S. Uh, trucking corridor. All the, the, all the traffic that would have been on that bridge is going to have to go around the other side of the Baltimore Beltway uh, because much of it can't go through the, the Baltimore Harbor Bridge, which pr prohibits hazardous materials like chemicals and, and, and flammables like propane and those sorts of things. So it's just going to create on the, on, the, on the ground and the roadways, it's going to create a lot of problems uh, for goods that need to flow up and down the eastern seaboard. Okay, Brendan, thank you very much. And as you can see, we've got a live shot there uh, of the press conference waiting for that to happen at the Francis, Key, Francis Scott uh, Bridge. Uh, no indications that the crash was intentional, according to uh, sources in the U.S. at the moment. Uh, we're counting down to that press, press conference, and we'll bring that to you as soon as it comes live. Let's get how the coal miners are faring in the wake of this bridge collapse. Abby, you're with me again. We're just hearing from Brendan there. It's not just uh, autos, but it is also a major coal port as well. It certainly is. And uh, we have some of the coal miners down sharply. In fact, we have Consol Energy having its worst uh, day of the year at this time. At one point, its lowest, its worst day uh, since October of last year. And the reason you were just mentioning uh, the uh, Consol Baltimore Marine Terminal is used to load, load coal into large ocean-going ships uh, in the area of the collapsed bridge. So again, Consol Energy is down, uh, Ramico down 3%. Uh, and then we also have uh, some of the railroads down, at least one, uh, because Consol's terminal is served by Norfolk Southern and CSX uh, Transportation. Uh, Norfolk is down about 2.6 percent, or at least it was in, uh, earlier. Uh, and then if we take a look at to the upside, though, we do have the social media ETF up 1.8 percent. And this, of course, having to do a lot with uh, the SPAC IPO, basically uh, merger, the debut of Trump Media and Technology Group. That uh, stock right now up uh, 40 percent. And then if we take a look at the sector action very quickly, Mattis, we usually do it in the other direction. But of course, we wanted to move right into those coal stocks and talk about the railroads on that tragedy in Baltimore. Uh, we have most sectors higher, 10 of 11 to be specific. Overall, the index up about one quarter of one percent. Discretionary is up seven tenths of one percent. The loan sector to the downside, well, that is energy with oil uh, down just fractionally. Abigail, thank you very much. The ramifications are broad. Coming up in the show, the markets moving events that will take you actually we are just we're just going to go straight to the press conference this morning our state is in shock and i want to take this moment to speak directly to the people of our state to our first responders i'm in awe of you i'm in awe of your courage i'm in awe of your strength i'm in awe of everything you do for each and every one of us you saw a crisis, and you said, what can I do to help? In 
our response teams are doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse literally as we speak. People who, as we speak, are out there are divers, our air assets, people who right now are working to save lives and are doing it because the state asked. And we will update the public as the work continues. To our partners inside and outside of government, I know this has been a long night. We started coordinating immediately after the Key Bridge collapsed. We've been standing together every step of the way from our county leadership to our city leadership, to our state leadership, to our federal leadership. And I'm grateful to call each and every one of you not just colleagues, but I'm grateful to call you friends. And to the people of Baltimore, and each and every one of the 6.3 million Marylanders who call our state home, I recognize that many of us are hurting right now. I recognize that many of us are scared right now. And so I want to be very clear about where everything stands. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Our administration is working closely with leaders from all levels of government and society to respond to this crisis, and not but just by addressing the immediate aftermath, but also by building a state that is more resilient and a state that's more safe. That is our pledge, and that's our commitment, and we're going to keep that commitment. And lastly, to the victims of this tragedy and their loved ones. All of our hearts are broken. We feel your loss. We're thinking of you. And we will always be thinking of you. We pray for the construction workers who are on the key bridge. And we pray for everyone who has been touched by this tragedy and their families and all of their loved ones. But Maryland, we will get through this. Because that is the Maryland spirit. And that's what Maryland is made of. We are Maryland tough, and we are Baltimore strong. So in the face of heartbreak, we come together. We embrace one another, and we come back strong. That's what we've always done. That's what we'll continue to do. And that's what we're going to get done together. And we're going to pray for Baltimore. And I'd like to turn this over to... Senator Van Hollen, who's done a remarkable job in our fellow delegation in providing support. So, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Governor. As the Governor said, we come together. We come together in Baltimore, we come together in Maryland. First of all, our hearts go out to all those who are on the bridge and their loved ones. We pray for them. Our gratitude goes out to the first responders who, as we speak, are out there continuing to conduct search and rescue operations. I want to thank the governor, the local, the mayor, the county executive, all the people gathered here as part of Team Baltimore and Team Maryland. And the federal government is with them as a partner. The Coast Guard, as we speak, is also part of this mission. Coast Guard cutters, Coast Guard aviation assets. I spoke uh, twice today uh, with Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg has pledged that they will do everything they can to very quickly release emergency response funds for this important project. The National Highway Transportation Administration Administrator is on his way to Baltimore if he's not here already. They will be releasing those early funds once all, all the parties are fully engaged. Second, the National Transportation Safety Board, I talked to the chair this morning, uh, she and her team will be conducting an investigation of what happened. And finally, the Army Corps of Engineers, naval assets uh, for uh, looking uh, below the surface uh, and clearing, all of this is going to be part of the effort. Uh, the governor uh, is leading Team Maryland. 
the mayor and the county executive, of course, Team Baltimore. Uh, but I'm just here to say, t together with Ben Cardin, Senator Cardin, um, and Congressman Fume and others, the federal government is your partner in this effort. Thank you, and again, to the people of our state and the people of this great city. We're with you. We love with you. We will get through this together. Thank you, Governor. Good morning again, uh, Paul Weedham, Secretary of Secretary Transportation. Just a few updates uh, since our meeting this morning. Um, the, uh, the crew that was out there working was basically repairing potholes. Just so you understand, that had nothing to do with a structural issue at all with the, in the facility. Um, at this time, one person has been uh, rescued and so far, and <coughs> our, continue, our efforts continue in terms of that. Um, engineers are on site right now determining both some of the structural issues, obviously some of the debris field, and we'll start to work that, but we'll work hand in hand with the NTSB before we take any further action in that area. With that, I did want to introduce the FBI for a few comments as well. Hello, my name is Bill Del Bagno. I'm the special agent in charge of the Baltimore Field Office. First and foremost, I want to say that our hearts go out to everyone that is impacted by this tragedy, especially the victims and their families. On behalf of the FBI, I would like to say that we are with you, we are with Baltimore, and we are with the partners every step of the way. The FBI, on very first, looking at and assessing this matter from an investigative standpoint, I want to be clear that there is no specific or credible information to suggest that there are ties to terrorism in this incident. The FBI has been part of this response from the beginning. We uh, came within one hour to the command post and quickly lashed up with our very strong partners all along the way. We will bring whatever resources that the FBI has to bear. We've already brought our crisis response our victim services, and just recently our underwater search evidence recovery teams are on site. And we will continue to provide all those resources as long as it takes. And as the investigation goes on, we will take it to its logical conclusion along with our partners. To the pe people of Baltimore, to the public, I ask you to be patient as we go through this and as information becomes available to us. And lastly, I want to say thank you. Thank you to our partners. Thank you to ev everyone who uh, in the FBI and counts on the FBI. We will always bring what we need to the people of Baltimore, and we are with you. I'd next like to introduce the Coast Guard. Coast Guard is still actively searching at this time. We are using response boat crews from two of our local Coast Guard stations, one of our Hilo crews from an air station in Atlantic City, and also one of our Cutter crews on one of our 87-foot patrol boats. We will continue to work with our local, state, and federal partners during this tragedy. Thank you. Governor, okay, Governor, so the question is, we're going to start from this side, we're going to start from this side. Governor, as, as far as you are aware, was the collapse of that bridge inevitable as that ship hit that part of the bridge? No, I mean, we're, we're still in the process of investigating exactly what happened, uh, so we, we don't have any further details uh, to about whether or not it was inevitable or not. But no structural issue with the bridge? No, there was, uh, in fact, the bridge was actually fully up to code, so we have no further information about uh, what was what, what happened during that time. Governor, is all, shipping, is all shipping in and out of the port now stopped completely, and do you have any estimate very early on as to how long it will be before shipping can resume? Yeah, we, we don't have uh, we don't have any estimates on timeline because right now our exclusive focus is on saving lives. Our exclusive focus is on search and rescue.